Welcome to the Daybreak with Jeff Slakey podcast. I'm so happy you found us. Please subscribe, rate, review, and share this with your circle of influence. It's a collection of the interviews, news, and conversation during Daybreak with Jeff Slakey on iFiber One News Radio, KMAS, weekdays from 6 to 9. Good morning to you. I hope you're having a great start to the day and make it even better because today's Friday. Good morning, Spencer. How's it going? Good, but it felt like a Tuesday, so I'm happy to hear it's Friday. Happy Friday to you. Great. Well, you can keep working tomorrow and the next day and the next day (laughs) all you want. Today on the show, local news and conversation, COVID numbers for you. Dr. Alex Apostle on school reopenings and Judge Stephen Greer talks about courts and COVID during our focus on Shelton. Since our report yesterday morning, Mason County Public Health notified of 12 additional Mason County residents testing positive for COVID-19. This brings the total to 268 positive cases in the county. Public Health continuing contact interviews. None are hospitalized in Mason County. Three are hospitalized outside. The total number of tests performed now 5,550. If you are showing symptoms, early testing is encouraged. Know this number, 360-427-3615. And that line could get you uh, to schedule an appointment through Mason Health's drive through COVID-19 testing center. House Republican leader J.T. Wilcox is the first Washington lawmaker known to have tested positive for COVID-19. He posted on Facebook this week that he has completed self-isolation period and is feeling great now. In his Tuesday post, Wilcox wrote that he decided to get tested after developing a cough in early August, later followed by temperature spikes in the afternoons. Lawmakers haven't been at the Capitol since they adjourned in March. Any meetings have been held remotely, and it's unclear what the 105 legislative session will look like when it convenes in January. State saw a decrease in both new weekly and total claims for unemployment benefits, more than 571,000 claims for benefits, with some of that number reflecting people who filed multiple claims, were filed for the week of August 2 through the 8th. That's down 13% from the previous week. Nearly 1.3 million people have filed claims for unemployment since early March when the pandemic job losses began. And more than, well, almost a million people who filed initial claims have been paid. To date, the state has paid more than nine and a half billion with a B in benefits, including federal money that has, until last month, provided the unemployed with an additional $600 a week on top of the state's weekly maximum benefit of up to uh, $790 per week. Washington clamors have been enjoying the opportunity to harvest shellfish on Puget Sound beaches this season, but higher participation means three Puget Sound beaches will close for clam harvest earlier than expected to help ensure gathering opportunities for years to come. Starting today, clam and mussel seasons will close at Hood Canal's Belfair State Park, the Potlatch Beaches, and Tuano State Park. While continued high participation may require additional management actions this year, many beaches remain open across the state. Harvesters can find up-to-date information on seasons and shellfish safety information on Washington's Shellfish Safety Map webpage. WDFW reminds harvesters to fill their clam holes after digging, leave oyster shells on the beach, and abide by size and daily limits to help maintain a sustainable resource and to avoid a ticket. Well, yesterday we posted on our website, Facebook, and YouTube channel A 35-minute conversation with Dr. Apostle and Kelly Neely from the Shelton School District about the start of the upcoming year. Topics included were lessons learned from the spring, student access and equity, contact with students, teacher mental health, a typical day, meals, and what the curriculum could look like. It answers a lot of questions that I saw parents have with the school districts, and school is starting in just a couple of weeks, so please check that out and uh, share that with friends that you may have in the Shelton School District. Again, today on the show, more from Alex Apostle. Uh, Also, Judge Greer talks about the courts and COVID during our Focus on Shelton, presented by our great friends at Our Community Credit Union. That's all coming up here this morning on Daybreak. From the iFiber One News Radio Studios, you're listening to Daybreak. 
Well, good Friday morning to you. The Daybreak Show rolls on. I'm happy to have on the phone line from the Shelton School District, Dr. Alex Apostle. Good morning, Alex. Good morning, Jeff. We are Great to be here with nice you. to talk with you as well. We're spending a lot of time uh, together as uh, later today or over the weekend, I'll be posting a conversation that you, me, and Kelly Neely had about the reopening of schools here uh, as we are just, well, less than, what, 20 days away or something like that. We're darn close. September 2nd is when school starts, yeah. So this is going to be an extended conversation that you'll see on our uh, website, Facebook page, and the Shelton School uh, District website, Facebook page. We're going to just go over and talk about some of the major uh, questions that parents have uh, for the kids as we get going. But we are getting close, and I know the school board meeting was a long one, about three and a half hours, but a lot of good information from the principals and things like that. Well, you know, we we felt strongly that uh, at this particular board meeting, we needed to bring our principals in to discuss how things were going in relation to the reopening of school. And I must say, and maybe um, quite a few people have listened into that particular board meeting, our principals did a fantastic job. Uh, the staff at the schools uh, are working closely with our administrators, and um, I'm telling you, I, I felt very, very good about the planning and how we're going to reopen schools in the Shelton School District. Uh, we're on task. We know what needs to be done. We're reaching out to parents in every way possible. Our, every one of our principals is setting up uh, either a Facebook uh, interaction with their parents or a Zoom in the form of an open forum, just to make sure that uh, we're answering uh, questions that parents may have. Uh, We're going to continue to do that uh, probably throughout the year where our principals are making sure that uh, we're providing the support that our parents and students need during these uh, difficult uh, times. Talk to me a little bit about the uh, information and monies that uh, OSPI released uh, to help connect some 60,000 students statewide. Uh, we were put it, the uh, story up on our website and, and showed some of the monies that are going to be coming into Shelton. What is that going to go towards? Well, you know, we have the um, the CARES Act, which is about $975,000, which is really going to help us in terms of technology and startup costs during these unprecedented times. That money, we, we allocated it uh, in about 10 minutes. That's how fast 975000 can be allocated wow. during these difficult and challenging times. Um, but, you know, a lot of the money that we're getting will go to assist uh, families that have tech- technology issues, and that's going to be very helpful, of course, in relation to the fact that our school district, among many, many others, are going 100% online. But it, within that, uh, we are going to be reaching out, of course, to families and students that have special circumstances and that might be uh, in the form of face-to-face instruction with a limited, a very limited amount, a number of students and staff uh, and staying within the health and safety guidelines. But uh, that money is, is extremely important and appreciated because the needs are tremendous. So if there is a group of students who need this type of learning that you're talking about, that they, they would benefit most with in-person learning. Would that be um, perhaps a collection of all the first graders together, or would it go almost like the old model of all the kids and all the grades are together, but because they um, may need some additional assistance, the teacher is able to... Um, prioritize the learning to each student? Do you, do you understand what I'm saying? Is it yeah, going to be grade I think by the, grade? The one thing that we, we need to be able to do is really determine what the specific needs are and um, create a program where we meet those specific needs at each grade level. Uh, that's going to be very, very important. Um, and again, the, the the circumstances that students are encountering along with the families is going to play a big part in terms of how we, we move forward. But there's no question. Uh, we have situations that are very 
um, special, and we're preparing to deal with those kinds of issues uh, throughout the year. Um, the, the 100%, when we say 100% online, it's 100% online, but we, we also have to provide for students that may need some extra help or families that need extra help. That That's where this money that you're talking about is really going to come into play because in our general fund, it, we don't have the, the, the money to do those things. Right. So uh, the, the, the state coming into play in the federal government in terms of uh, improving technology and improving uh, our budget overall uh, is critical if we're going to be successful. We'll talk about this more and then it'll be available again too as a, we have a, a extended conversation about the start of the school year. But let's look back to the end of last year and the end of spring. Uh, how will the education and direction be different than what we saw in the spring. There was a lot of, well, this is new for everybody, of course, and and the kids are going to pass and they're going to get through to the next year. Uh, are those same accommodations being kind of just opened up or, or are you expecting that through the your staff, your teachers, and the K-12 program that you're uh, joining up with to really be able to um, – get good learning and have actual, uh, you know, good results at the end of a school year? Absolutely. You know, last spring we were asked to transition a 100 plus year old model of education in about 30 days. Yeah. And I really feel our teachers under those circumstances did a stellar job. I, I really do believe that, but we've learned, we learned a lot in the spring. And what we're doing is we're going to incorporate those learnings into starting this particular school year. And the K-12 platform that we're incorporating in terms of our instructional model is going to provide consistency and, and clarity uh, for students, for, for parents, and for our staff, quite frankly. So that's, a, that's going to be a big, big difference. Right along with that, the K-12 platform that we're going to be implementing also provides not only support for staff in terms of professional development, but it provides support for parents and for students. So that's going to be a big difference. But, you know, the heart of our teachers uh, is going to be the same. Uh, they want to do the very best possible for, for our students in terms of their, uh, their education. And I have tremendous faith in our people that uh, they're they're rallying to the cause as we speak and they're ready to go and they would like nothing better quite frankly than to be face to face with our kids but the health and safety of our staff and our students and our families is a priority one in the Shelton School District and so um I really have tremendous faith in our staff that it's it's going to be a different ball game when school starts in the fall and the school starts in less than three weeks. Wednesday, September second is the first day. Yeah, we're uh, we're anxious for that to take place, and we're going to be prepared. The other thing I'd like to communicate is that you know things can change quickly, sure. And we're going to be monitoring you know the online learning uh, almost daily. And if there's a, any uh, change in the pandemic or any uh, changes that need to be made in terms of the K-12 platform, we're going to make those changes uh, as necessary. So um, this is the way we're going to start school. It doesn't mean that this is the way we're going to end school. But we're going to be prepared for whatever comes down the road in terms of student learning, in terms of the pandemic. We're going to be ready, and the work that our subcommittees put forth uh, is really going to play an important role in being nimble and flexible to the environment that we're going to encounter. So I have uh, basically, I, I'm very confident. I have tremendous faith in our in our staff and in our families and in our students that the Shelton School District is going to do just fine in 2021. I have friends uh, in other school districts who have uh, privately mentioned to me uh, that they uh, really like what the Shelton School District has decided on for uh, consistency and for equity across the whole uh, of the student body. And some other districts have a, have a couple of different options for 
their classes, and it may not uh, have that same consistency that, that you're talking about here for the Shelton School District. So that's really good. Again, a reminder, too, that on our Facebook page and website and the Shelton School District's pages, uh, we will have an extended conversation with me, uh, Dr. Apostle, and Kelly Neely on the reopening of schools here, and that will be uh, answering a lot of the questions that I've seen come across social media and a lot of questions that you have uh, received over the last couple of months as well. Dr. Apostle, good to talk with you, and uh, we'll check in soon. All right. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Alex. Take care. Bye. You're listening to Daybreak on i Fiber One News Radio. And welcome to another episode of Daybreak. We have our focus on Shelton brought to us by our friends at Our Community Credit Union. We have here in the green room with us Shelton Municipal Court Judge Stephen Greer, who uh, is going to talk about the uh, proceedings at the courthouse and what's going on and how COVID has affected everyone there. Judge, uh, welcome to Daybreak. Thank you very much. Thanks for being with us. Uh, before you became a municipal court judge, you were with the district court for quite a few years as well, a lot of judicial experience. That's correct, about 14, 15 years uh, filling in with the district court and about 25 years with the kids at the district court as a substitute judge. Now, with all your judicial experience, have you ever witnessed anything like this pandemic? I mean, this is new to all of us pretty much, but is this pretty unprecedented for you where procedures like this have to take place? Uh, this is unusual times. Nothing like this has ever happened. So we're all learning as we go. Uh, the court system across the state of Washington is uh, run by the Washington State Supreme Court. Uh, so they're giving us the guidelines to follow every day as we operate our courts. So you operate under the court, not under the governor's office or anything like that? Correct. Uh, the Washington State Supreme Court has pretty much reflected the governor's rulings most of the time. Uh, so, for instance, we've been open in the city since June 1st, which is sooner than the rest of the city opened, uh, because uh, the state Supreme Court wanted the courts open to the public. And so we do have slightly different guidelines. And they were closed right around when everything else started closing down, like late March or April? When did uh, – how long were the courts closed? Uh, late March, all of April and all of May. Uh, during that time period, there's been a lot of cooperation between the courts. And so the city court used the district court courtroom because they had the video capacity to make us broadcast out to the public, something the city does not have. It also included the cooperation of the Mason County Superior Court that allowed us to use one of their video rooms in the jail. So there's been a lot of court cooperation. How has the cooperation been with people coming in and out of the courts? With uh, I know people have all sorts of political views on the masks, and people get agitated, it seems like, either way. If they have to wear them, if they don't wear them people not wearing them. How has it been overall with uh, the employees of the court and also the public and, and people involved in the cases? Is everyone pretty cooperative? Uh, the employees have been 100% cooperative. Uh, they know this is a serious matter. It has nothing to do with politics. Uh, courts are neutral. Uh, the Washington State Supreme Court has asked us to follow the CDC guidelines and the L&I guidelines uh, during this time period. Uh, the public, uh, which includes everyone from well-to-do people to homeless people, and people with mental illnesses have been 100% cooperative, uh, with only, I think, one exception uh, since we opened. And uh, counsel uh, for the defendants have also been completely cooperative. So it's gone really well. What do you have to do? What are the procedures for putting people at ease? Just kind of peace of mind. I would imagine there's a protocol of everything from disinfecting to what if somebody shows up at the court, they've forgotten their mask. Are they supplied to people if, if they ask for them or are they turned away until they can come back with one? How does that work? So we try to help people out. So if they come to the court and do not have a mask, we do have a mask we can give them. Uh, my security officer has a supply of masks. And uh, for those who either for mental health reasons or physical reasons do not feel comfortable wearing a mask, uh, they can phone in. Uh, to the courtroom and be accommodated in that way. And we do have those notices in English and Spanish uh, on our doors. So we're doing everything we can to cooperate. Uh, we've had people come to court who said they're uncomfortable wearing a mask, even though they wore one anyway, uh, many for maybe mental health reason that makes them feel very uncomfortable and kind of scared. And so we take care of them right away, get them out right away, and let them know that they can call in for next hearing if they, in conjunction with their attorney to work that out. And one thing I was curious about is I've, I've noticed – court cases just on television around the country. I don't know how it is specifically in Shelton, but 
oftentimes judges and people before the judge wearing kind of the clear visor type is that are any mask i mean i'm wearing a bandana here it's it's kind of double layered does it have to be kind of the more medical type mask or as long as the face is covered uh, what are you seeing with that uh face and nose have to be covered uh Nobody's come in with a, the shield yet, uh, as you want to call it, but it is acceptable uh, to do that. Uh, a lot of people come in with bandanas, uh, but the majority of people are coming in with your traditional type mask. Um, I have access to the mask I'm wearing right now, which is actually supplied by the uh, police chief the other day, um, and, but I also have medical masks as well, which sometimes I do wear. How do you see that it affects, uh, I always wonder about personality. There's so much involved with the judge and the people before the judge and attorneys and, and the public. One thing I really dislike about the mask, not so much the inconvenience of wearing them. I'm used to that and I, I want to be safe and make everyone else feel safe as well. The one disturbing thing to me is kind of the lack of expression kind of. Does that play into any of that where you can't really look and see? It's almost like a poker face where you... We lose a lot of that with communication. I know that in the courts, communications paramount. Has that affected anything at all? You do lose some of that. Uh, that is true. Uh, but I also have 30 years of mental health experience. So uh, believe it or not, seeing their eyes and their movements sure. with their hands helps me a lot. Um, and for example, the district court, uh, which has been using the city for trials, they have their testifying witnesses without a mask and they put up plexiglass shields uh, to protect other people in the room so that exactly what you said so people can see the expression on the face because that is important at some times. Sure and uh, when you reopened June 1st what kind of a backlog was there? Was it uh, hard to kind of get back on track and how are you looking now in <laughs> terms of court cases moving smoothly through the system? We had a major backlog when we reopened because prior to that, we were only doing in custody matters when people came to the jail, nothing else. Uh, <clears throat> so our arraignment calendars for a while were double or more uh, the normal size. Uh, our criminal calendars were about double the normal size. It's starting to slow down, uh, which is a good thing. And so I think we're handling it really well. The staff's been fantastic. I have great staff and they've been working really hard and we're making it through. Speaking of staff, did the numbers get cut down at all? Was everybody deemed essential within the court uh, environment, or how did that affect your staffing levels? The court is essential, uh, but the staff, I have uh, an administrator and 2.25 clerks and a community service supervisor. Uh, and the, the clerks are union, so they took furloughs like all their union members did. Uh, my administrator took a voluntary furlough of one day a week, as did my community service supervisor. Uh, we believe in the city that every kind of bears the burden. Uh, we're all sharing the Titan budget. And even though we were still open, uh, we just pushed forward. And for those of us who don't know, I'm fascinated by all this, but I don't know a lot of the intricacies of it. What are some of the main differences between district court, so the Mason County District Court versus the Shelton Municipal Court in terms of the type of cases that you see? The district court and city court both handle the same type of criminal cases, which is your misdemeanors and gross misdemeanors. The Shelton court for those that happen inside the city limits. Uh, the district court covers the whole county. The big difference is city courts do not do civil cases. So the district court has small claims, uh, anti-harassment orders, domestic violence protection orders, uh, civil lawsuits, uh, and the city court does not have any of those matters. Anything else going over at the uh, Municipal Courthouse you'd like to talk about or anything uh, coming up? Uh, well, I think morale has been an issue uh, with everybody. I mean, things have been dragging on. <clears throat> and so I believe our local Chamber of Commerce has joined in with uh, drawing chalk designs on the sidewalk here later this month. Oh, okay. And uh, I told my staff we're going to join in on that. And I think the city might be coming along with us. And Friday, I challenged the district court to join in us in that activity as well. And I think it'll be a good morale booster. I think we have to uh, recognize the staff is pretty stressed and they need a break. It's taken a toll. That's one thing I've noticed too, is it's brought people together, but it's kind of torn us apart too. And people working from home and those with kids who have to teach their kids at home and distance learning and Zoom interviews and 
Are, are some of the procedures done by Zoom in the courthouse? Do you involve uh, have any of that stuff like remote uh, Skype the, and other The city uh, court does not have the ability to do Zoom per se uh, because we also have the added obligation of broadcasting outward to the general public. And what we can't loop in is our video screen to the jail, uh, okay. which is a separate video system. And so that's where the county came in when we were completely closed. Uh, they have a much more complicated video system already in place. They layered Zoom on top of it. So we could put the courtroom and the jail screen and the Zoom all linked together and then out to the public so they can see what's going on because we have to be open to the public. So right now, we're not doing that. Uh, some people call into the court, but our room, courtroom is open to the public. Our guest has been Shelton Municipal Court Judge Stephen Greer, and uh, this has been Focus on Shelton, brought to you by your friends at our community credit union. Judge, thanks a lot for your time and all your hard work and your staff as well over there. Thank you very much for having me here today. Appreciate it. Thanks for answering all the questions. From the iFiber One News Radio Studios, you're listening to Daybreak. And a good morning to you, Friday here as the Daybreak Show rolls on. Spencer, good morning. Hey, good morning. Happy Friday. The drive-ins, we've been talking a lot. Yesterday we talked about the drive-ins at the Rodeo Drive-In and the Skyline Drive-In. Those have uh, had a, seen a resurgence in popularity since COVID as it is a, a great social distancing event. I mean, you're in your cars. The only time sure. you would ever interact with anybody really is if you have to go to the concession stand or to the restroom. Here is, uh, and this has then led, of course, to the um, the concert series that we've seen. There was yes. a Garth Brooks did a drive-in at the Skyline Drive-In. They had that uh, Stephanie Myers event, the Twilight yeah. author. You know, she yeah. has that new that new book out on the Twilight series, and so they did a thing there. We've seen also churches do this with the at drive-ins or at least with large parking lots and it's like a drive-in service yes and now there's another one that's coming this is a smart idea i think it's a good one too down in orlando a big uh, drive-in rave tell me more about this yeah so this is at the ace cafe in downtown orlando they're holding the drive-in rave august 22nd so-called tailbreak rave will let the socially distanced occupants of as many as 80 cars Enjoy live music from a collection of DJs, including the uh, godfather of bass, DJ Magic Mike, On to Mike, Sweet Charlie, and more. I've never been... I remember have, I, DJ Magic... No, go ahead. Oh, no, I was going to say, I've never been to a rave in my life. Does that make me, does that make me a square? No, it doesn't make you a square. I think raves probably started popping up in the um, early... Well, at least my understanding of raves, you know, late 80s, early 90s. And Stephanie says you're a L7, but for the, uh, <laughs> I don't think so. Because, you know, early, nine, early 90s on those raves, that's not where you were in life. Oh, you yeah, yeah, no. God. You weren't I, heading down to the, to the warehouse district to go to a illegal rave. Oh, my gosh. Can, music bumping. I remember DJ Magic Mike. I remember buying a cassette tape at Camelot Music of DJ Magic Mike and on the tape, you know, he had low, low bass. The cars we had never had any sort of sound system that would ever even come close to being able to play that kind of music. But uh, we had a good time and I do remember some people playing DJ Magic Mike and it was just, you could hear it blocks down the road <laughs> so he goes to show you how little i know that's not the same magic mic as uh, channing uh, tatum then <laughs> no that's a different that's Very a different, different magic mic you're right that's a different that's a different one this thing's kind of cool and i think you know if you have it all in the cars you know i would imagine somebody they're streaming this as well so all the cars could tune into the same frequency imagine how loud that would be Oh, yeah. It's pretty cool. And and I was wondering about the dancing part, and I guess they're going to allow people to exit their cars and to dance. I mean, I can't imagine a rave without that, right? Otherwise, it's just kind of listening right. to the, the DJ or to the music or the radio. It's, chamber, they it's are, just chamber music, if you yeah. know it is. <laughs> they are going to do temperature checks, though, and make people wear face masks. Oh, that's neat. 
That's cool. That's a, another new way that people are trying to uh, uh, beat back uh, COVID by having some more experiences. Uh, Daybreak Show continues. Good morning. Hi, Fiber One News Radio, 1030 KMAS and FM 1033 presents Daybreak. Good Friday morning again to you. Hope you're having a great start to the day. Way to wrap up the week and look ahead to the weekend where I believe still very warm temperatures on Sunday. Spencer, how are you doing? Hey, I'm doing all right. What about yourself? You still been reporting on the mid-90s for Sunday? Is that yeah, right? it looks like I'll get an update for us here in a little bit, but it looks like we're going to be at least in the mid-90s Sunday. But the good news is once we survive Sunday, it's not like we're going to get a week of it or anything. It's going to be gone. Well, one thing, if you are uh, feeling way too hot to go outside, sometimes what folks will do is just sit on the couch and play a video game, perhaps. Unfortunately, for folks with Apple products and fans of Fortnite, there is uh, something that happened during the overnight over the last couple of days or something. Apple has dropped Fortnite from the App Store after the game's developer introduced a direct payment plan that bypasses Apple's platform. And Apple takes a 30% cut for an in-app revenue purchases. Wow. So that means if you buy, uh, you know, more um, Candy Crush Lives yeah, or yeah. whatever you buy on the App Store, Rob- Robux or Minecraft coins, whatever you're buying, Apple gets 30% of that. And we got to remember, this is a billion-dollar franchise. I mean, Fortnite is incredibly huge all over the world. And 30% of that cut is a huge amount of money. People buy, what is it, what do they call V-Bucks or something on Fortnite? So people buy those V-Bucks all the time so they could get new skins or new characters or new, you know, weapons or flags and stuff. It is, as you mentioned, I think for the past, it's a... it, yeah, it's a free game, but for the past three years, it has been the most, it's brought in the most money. It really is incredible. There's, there's, there's the models of games and apps that you pay once and then you have it forever, or the free ones that kind of get sure. you in. And then yeah, it's 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 a brilliant concept, isn't it? Because it's it's a digital reward. It doesn't cost anything you know what i mean like these skins are cool and the kids want them but it doesn't someone created it but it's not like you're physically sewing a different costume and having to mail it to somebody like in the physical world it's all it's all instant money i mean it's it's a it's a brilliant concept and uh and and the creation of those things is a one-timer like you just said if you're buying if everybody in america buys a shirt yeah. Somebody's going to have to make 330 million shirts. Yeah. If somebody wants to buy a new shirt on Fortnite, it was one person who coded that and who knows how long it take to code that, but but there you're one and done on that one. Yeah, so so this is off the App Store. Does that mean if you've already downloaded it, you could still play it or did it disappear off people's I phones? Let's, I wonder. You have it on your phone, let's right? See if it's still on my but ever since Animal Crossing, I you haven't played I, it much, have you? I haven't played it, no. We've been playing too, Animal Crossing too much. Let me see. It's not on my phone anymore. I used to have it on the iPad. Let me see if I still have... No, it's still there. I was, And I'm huh. loading it up. Let's see if it loads all the yeah, way. Yeah, so I'm wondering if they're just making it like your grandfather did, where if you already have it, you have it. But if you want to get it, you can't currently. Well, it's stuck on a connecting screen. Launch when ready. I'm not sure. Interesting. Yeah, I look for it on my phone, and obviously updating. it's not there. Well, we'll see. It's got some updating to do. So maybe if you already have it, it'll still work. That's amazing that they did that. The other quick hitter here for you before we get out of this segment, TikTok and its U.S. employees planning to take uh, the Trump administration to court over this order that could ban that TikTok app. Now, I thought I saw somewhere on a headline that said TikTok was collecting MAC addresses, M-A-C addresses, um, for a long time on users' products that it wasn't supposed to. So that was Ooh. another part of this, um, which could it, which could prove out the need for this. Well, maybe I should uninstall TikTok. I've only done a few videos. 
TikTok collected 15, oh, I'm sorry, TikTok collected Mac addresses for 15 months on its Android app. That was from The Verge, Wall Street Journal, and TechCrunch two days ago. Hmm. So maybe there is some stuff, maybe there is something here on that one. I don't, I'm not sure, but whatever. Yeah, that's interesting. All right, more Daybreak Show coming up here as we wrap up our technological segment for the morning. Thank you so much for listening to today's Daybreak with Jeff Slakey podcast. Again, I'm so happy and honored you found us and chose to listen. Please subscribe, rate, review, and share this with your circle of influence. It's a collection of some of the interviews, news, and conversation during Daybreak with Jeff Slakey on i Fiber one News Radio KMAS weekdays from 6 to 9. Thank you so much again and talk with you next time.